This video is kindly sponsored by Hunter Killer. Find out more later in the video. Hey, 42 here. They say necessity is the mother of all invention. And that maxim is never truer than in times of war, where a technological advantage over your enemies can be just as valuable as a numerical one. For that reason, many of the major conflicts in history have led to a flurry of important breakthroughs. Radar, night vision goggles, the jet engine, and nuclear weapons were all perfected during the Second World War, for example. But there's more to winning a battle than simply having the best weapons or the most soldiers. The ability to outthink your enemy is just as important as outnumbering or outgunning them. And outthinking your enemy isn't just about flanking maneuvers and getting to higher ground. In this picture, you can see several M4 Sherman tanks, a popular vehicle used by the Allies throughout the Second World War, and a three-ton support lorry. These are serious tools of war, and I'm sure your average Nazi would have fought twice about attempting to storm this highly strategic copse of trees. But you might be surprised to learn that the vehicles in this image were built with one serious weakness the Nazis were never aware of. A design of Death Star proportions. They could be completely and utterly destroyed with a single pinprick. Quite often, I can spend longer trying to find something new to watch on TV than I actually do watching it. And like many, recently, I've been watching more and more crime and murder mystery content. And so when I found Hunter Killer, it's fair to say I was pretty excited. Hunter Killer is a murder mystery subscription box, and it's one of the most unique games that I've ever played. With each delivery, you'll sift through piles of documents, evidence, audio recordings, and case files, eliminating suspects and identifying murder weapons until you crack the case and catch the killer. But Hunter Killer isn't just about solving a murder. This game tells an immersive story slowly unfolding over time. You'll learn about the backstories of each of the suspects, their complicated relationships, and watch everything unfold as you complete each episode. I had so much fun playing through the first episode of the Curtain Call story. When a body is found in the attic of a Depression-era art deco theatre called The Cadence, I was called in to track down the killer and find out what happened. Just imagine your favourite murder mystery TV series, but you're actually in it, a part of it, and better yet, you're the leading detective. You can actually touch and feel the lifelike props and clues that are supplied in each box. And the best part is that right now you can get 20% off your first box. All you have to do is head to hunterkiller.com forward slash 40 and use the code 40 at checkout. Again, use the code 40 for 20% off. Do you have what it takes to hunt a killer? You see, these apparently imposing war machines aren't actually machines at all. They're made of nothing more than rubber and air. A bunch of giant balloons the Allies used to fool German reconnaissance planes into believing their forces were much larger and better equipped than they actually were. And that's a textbook example of outthinking your enemy using military deception. In the First World War, military deception was used in various inventive ways by both sides. This, for example, is a camouflage tree. And if you're wondering why exactly anyone would want to camouflage a tree, allow me to explain. Choose a tree, somewhere out in the middle of no man's land, found between two entrenched armies. Have an artist create a perfect reproduction of said tree out of metal, canvas and print. Then. Under cover of darkness, creep out into no man's land, cut the real tree down, and replace it with the fake one. And here's the sneaky part. The fake tree is hollow, with just enough space inside to allow a spotter or two to hide in plain sight, close to the enemy lines. Genius. Camouflage in general has always been a pillar of military deception. 
But one place in particular it's difficult to implement is out on the open ocean. After all, there's not much point painting a warship blue when the very fact it sticks up several meters above the endless expanse of flat ocean means it will be instantly visible to enemy ships from miles away. British artist Norman Wilkinson solved this little problem with something he called dazzle camouflage. If you've ever seen an optical illusion, you'll know just how completely the human eye can be fooled by the clever use of geometry, colour and patterns. Dazzle Camouflage took advantage of that fact by turning entire warships into giant optical illusions, so as to make it difficult for enemy ships and submarines to accurately assess their speed and heading, crucial factors for lining up an attack run or torpedo strike. During the First World War, literally thousands of battleships were bedazzled, I mean bedazzled in this way, and the practice was used even as recently as the Second World War. Speaking of the Second World War, the Allies' global battle with the Germans and their Axis buddies took military deception to new heights. In fact, it's no exaggeration to say that deception techniques had a decisive impact on the outcome of the war. If you've been following the channel recently, you'll be familiar with the story of Operation Mincemeat, an allied plot to fool Adolf Hitler with a genuine rotting human corpse. But around six months after Operation Mincemeat was put into action, those sneaky allies were at it again, only this time they were cooking up a far grander deception. In 1944, the Allies were preparing for what would become one of the defining moments of the war, the invasion of German-occupied France. The idea was to open up a new front against the Axis in Europe, stretching their already taxed armies to breaking point. But landing a large number of troops in heavily fortified northern France was going to be tough. Not least because Hitler and his generals were well aware this attack would come sooner or later, and so they built the Atlantic Wall, a series of coastal defences and fortifications designed to fend off a land invasion launched from Britain. But whilst it was only a matter of time before the Allies attacked, exactly where the invasion would take place was a little less clear. There were four potential sites for the landing. Brittany, the Contenton Peninsula, Normandy and the Pas Calais. Brittany and Contenton were ruled out pretty quickly. Both are peninsulas, meaning there was a risk Allied forces pushing into France could be cut off from support on the coast. The Pas Calais was arguably the most sensible point of attack, being significantly closer to the south coast of England than the other sites, but for that reason it was also the most heavily defended part of the French coastline. And so, the Allies decided to turn their attention to Normandy, which, though a little further away, was less well defended and offered an ideal entry point from which to push deeper into central France. But storming Normandy against a prepared, entrenched army would be disastrous, inevitably costing the lives of tens of thousands of men. Which meant only one thing. It was time for a bit of classic military deception. The idea was simple. Convince Hitler the Allied invasion of mainland Europe would come at the Pas Calais, before actually landing at Normandy. But achieving that goal was going to be one hell of a challenge. With Operation Mincemeat, the Allies used controlled leaks, the release of false information, to fool the Axis powers into defending the wrong location prior to the invasion of Sicily. But controlled leaks alone simply weren't going to cut it this time, and the reason for that was proximity. Calais is just 20 miles from Dover on the south coast of England, and that meant German reconnaissance planes had a pretty good view of what was going on over there on the other side of the channel. A full-scale land invasion requires a huge army, scores of tanks, hundreds of ships and planes, and hundreds of thousands of troops. For an attack on Pas Calais, that army would need to be stationed in the southeast of England near Dover. So if German spy planes reported that Dover was about as busy as your average nightclub during lockdown, Hitler would immediately know something was up. 
It was time to start pumping up those inflatable tanks, because the Allies were about to conjure an entire field army of more than 100,000 men, literally out of thin air. As well as inflatable tanks, fake aircraft like this one were built by the 100, and positioned next to equally fake landing strips and various important looking but fake equipment. The airsats tank, aircraft and other military vehicles were all carefully camouflaged. Carefully, but not too carefully. The Allies needed German spy planes to be able to find them, after all, but if they made it too easy, it might look suspicious. Speaking of German planes and making things look believable, British anti-aircraft gunners were given an unusual assignment. They were to let German reconnaissance planes pass safely through British airspace, whilst making it seem like they were trying to shoot them down. Fake tanks and aeroplanes are one thing, but what about the ships? An invasion force would need to be supported by hundreds of landing craft, and unlike tanks, inflatable ships bobbing around on the water were unlikely to fool anyone, even at a distance. The problem was, landing craft were big. How the hell were the Allies going to make fake versions of these beasts that looked genuinely convincing from the air? Actually, the landing craft in this image are fake. These three were moored up in the Thames estuary, just waiting to be seen by German reconnaissance planes in the lead up to the Normandy landings. But hundreds were built in total. They were nicknamed Big Bobs and were made from scaffolding tubes, wood and canvas all floated on 40-gallon oil drums. They were delivered like giant IKEA flat packs from around the country and could be built by a team of soldiers in just six hours. And I'm sure you'll agree, they look pretty bloody realistic. I'm having a hard time believing they're fake, and I made this video. To complete the illusion of a huge invasion force preparing for war, all these fake vehicles were supplemented by a sustained campaign of hundreds of thousands of coded radio messages sent all around the UK. These signals were carefully designed to mimic the kind of communications you might see from a real field army gearing up for battle. By this point in the war, Britain had amassed a large number of double agents that the Nazis believed were loyal to Germany, and these two were mobilised en masse to support the idea of an invasion in the Pas Calais. To put the icing on this giant fake cake, General George Patton, the Allied commander Hitler and the Axis powers feared the most, was personally brought in to lead this non-existent army, which was dubbed the First United States Army Group, or FUSAG. Patton, known as Old Blood and Guts, had established a fearsome reputation in various battles in the Mediterranean earlier in the war, and he was exactly the kind of heroic commander the enemy would expect to lead the invasion of France. Now it might seem like a bit of a waste to put a man like Patton in charge of an army that didn't exist, but unbeknownst to Hitler and co, Patton had actually been temporarily removed from battlefield command at the time for slapping two battleshock soldiers after the invasion of Sicily. Giving Patton command of Fuzag allowed the Allies to make use of his reputation whilst he was otherwise out of action. It also probably didn't hurt that non-existent soldiers can't get battleshocked, and they don't much mind being slapped. In one final sneaky, brilliant act by the Allies, a German POW being sent home not long before the invasion was led through what he believed to be Kent in the southeast of England, which he saw with his own two eyes was swarming with troops, tanks and supplies. In reality, the British had taken the man through Hampshire, and what he'd actually seen was the real invasion force that British General Bernard Montgomery was about to lead to Normandy. This multi-pronged deception was collectively known as Operation Fortitude South, and it was a truly colossal undertaking, involving masses of resources and a giant chunk of wartime cash. But boy was it worth it. Just picture the evidence Hitler had been presented with. 
Reconnaissance reports suggesting a huge gathering of vehicles of war near Dover, an observation that was corroborated by multiple unrelated German spies and many weeks of radio evidence. Even one of his own soldiers, the returning prisoner of war, backed up the story, and he'd actually been there. The Allies even went as far as to apparently soften up the Paid Calais in the weeks leading up to the invasion, with targeted bombing runs of defences and key infrastructure, whilst leaving Normandy almost entirely alone. In the face of this overwhelming evidence, the Führer concentrated the bulk of his forces at the Paid Calais. So, when 130,000 or so Allied troops landed at Normandy on the 6th of June 1944, it came as a bit of a shock. The battle was still incredibly bloody, with thousands of Allied troops losing their lives that first day. The location of landing hadn't been anticipated, but Normandy was still part of the Atlantic Wall and was therefore defended to some extent. In spite of the losses, D-Day, as it has become known, was a huge success, giving the Allies the footholds they needed in mainland Europe. As for Operation Fortitude, it was so convincing that even after the Allies landed at Normandy, Hitler was still expecting a second invasion force, led by General Patton, to rock up at the Pays Calais any day now. <laughs> And so he continued to maintain heavy defences there for a good four months after D-Day, buying the Allies precious time to fully establish themselves in France. The Allies may well still have won the war without Operation Fortitude and the army that didn't exist, but there's no doubt that by fooling the Germans, countless lives were saved on D-Day and beyond. And hey, that's not bad for a bunch of tank-shaped party balloons and some floating scaffolding. Thanks for watching.